Moderating this morning's symposium is Dr. Austin Shelton, a native of Guam who became a marine and environmental scientist to help solve island environmental challenges. He serves as the director of the UOG Center for Island Sustainability and Sea Grant Program, and is the co-principal investigator and education and workforce development coordinator for Guam EPSCOR. Half a day, everyone. The United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development was born out of the recognition that more needs to be done to reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health and create improved conditions for the sustainable development of the ocean, seas, and coasts. It starts now, in 2021, to provide a common framework to ensure ocean science can fully support countries to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The Ocean Decade provides an opportunity to strengthen the management of our coasts and oceans for the benefit of humanity. In just a moment, we're going to welcome the EPSCOR Guam Ecosystems Collaboratorium for Corals and Oceans panel. The Guam EPSCOR program at the University of Guam is funded by a five-year, $20 million grant from the National Science Foundation's Established Program to Stimulate Competitive Research, or EPSCOR for short. This is the largest competitive science grant our institution has received to date. Guam EPSCOR will stimulate, uh, will situate Guam as a premier research and STEM education hub, bolstering sustainability, economic development, and informed decision-making by engaging communities in 21st century science. As we do this, we will broaden the participation of Pacific Islander communities in STEM fields through a research program that advances the sustainability of coral reef ecosystems in the face of environmental change. Today, our discussion panel will answer, what is Guam EPSCOR Gecko? We will reveal its contributions to ocean science and we'll explore what this means for our sustainable future. In case we don't get to your questions before the end of the session, please type them in the chat box and we'll ask our EPSCOR researchers to be responding there. To begin our panel, we have Professor Terry Donaldson from the University of Guam Marine Laboratory, who serves as Principal Investigator and Project Director for Guam EPSCOR. He was recently voted President-Elect of the Western Association of Marine Laboratories. Good morning, Dr. Donaldson. Please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Good morning, Terry. Uh, yeah. uh, please tell us a little <laughs> bit about yourself. And okay, sure, well, I'm Sorry getting an echo that. here. I'm getting an echo here, but thanks very much, Austin. Good day, everyone. A um, little bit about myself. I uh, did my master's degree, ironically, at the University of Guam Marine Laboratory back in the day. Went off, did a PhD, but did some of that work here. And I've been more or less associated with Guam and the Mariana Islands for probably 40 years. I'm starting to age myself. Anyway, um, moving on to the EPSCORP, um, Part of all of this, Austin just gave my speech for me, so I'll try to fill in the little bits that uh, he may have missed. Uh, this particular project, Gecko, builds upon something called the Guam Ecosystems Collaboratorium that we undertook uh, between 20, uh, tw uh, 2016 through 2020, a five-year project, funded at a much more modest level of $6 million. And uh, we did pretty well, which is why we were funded again. We got to put in a competitive proposal. It was a highly competitive field. Uh, for funding, and we were successful. And what we've done is taken some of the things we'd learned from the Guam Ecosystems Collaboratorium, and we've moved them on uh, into more or less, a, a, we have a broader reach this time around. We're considering more aspects of, of biodiversity and oceanographic physical processes. And uh, on the EWD side of things, we're all, which is education, workforce development and diversity, uh, we're expanding there as well as, as Dr. Shelton will tell you a bit later. Um, we have a number of different groups. Uh, we have something called a, a phenomes group and a genomes group. This builds upon the NSF National Science Foundation uh, big ideas um, initiative they started, genomes and phenomes. And we've uh, taken some of that and run with it with respect to corals and marine invertebrates and other types of or marine and aquatic invertebrates and some other organisms as well. Uh, we have something called the biorepository, which is a uh, more or less a source for genetic and, and uh, physical information about uh, the biodiversity of, of Guam in the region. And uh, we also uh, 
incorporate lots of different data sources for that. Uh, we're assembling a lot of different collections of the biorepository, not just ones that we make for the project, but we're bringing in all the other collections that we can uh, to build a, a, a sort of a, a large scale basis for, for people all over the world uh, to access the information that we have digitized in our database to find out what's really happening around here as far as, as our biodiversity is concerned. And uh, there's cyber in infrastructure uh, components to this that you'll hear about later in this panel and of course the EWP. And one of the things I want to stress also is that we're collaboratorium. Um, by nature, it means collaboration. And we've been doing this with scientists and researchers and, and um, environmental people, managers, that type of thing, literally all over the world. Uh, there are a lot of people have ideas, they want to work with us. We have ideas, we want to work with them and we put things together and, and run with it. And uh, this is an exciting thing for us. Uh, again, we started it with the previous project and we're gonna continue it through the five years of this project. And it allows us to bring people here to work with us. We can work with those people on common questions that are within the scope of our, our research project. And in general, try to get a handle on what's happening um, in the region with respect to things like climate change, uh, changes in oceanographic currents that affect connectivity and other factors that are, are of interest to us. And I think my time has run up. Is that correct? Well, thank you, Terry, for that informative overview and sharing about the different components of our Guam EPSCOR uh, GECCO program. Um, we're going to be uh, talking quite a bit about the phenomes and genomes next. Would you mind uh, sharing with our audience um, what those mean? Uh, well, I'd rather let the panel go into that in some detail, but essentially genomes is big picture and the phenomes is how um, environmental influences cause uh, the genomes to react to, to, to different things. Uh, again, the big drivers here for us are things like climate change, uh, so seawater uh, temperature rise, those types of things. How do they affect the organisms and how do those organisms respond? Uh, do they die, go away, or do they say, wait a minute, we're not through yet, and, and they carry on? And this comes through uh, adapting to different environmental parameters. Um, things like sedimentation, turbidity, uh, ocean acidification may, may be of interest to us as well, because it certainly is of interest to everyone else out there, especially in cooler climates. And um, again, we're looking at, at resilience and seeing how a system, how organisms within that system react to change and, and what they can do about it in order to survive. Thank you very much, Dr. Donaldson, for that informative overview. Um, we're going to get go next into our, our uh, next groups of researchers. Uh, I just wanted to say to our audience out there, uh, thank you very much for, for joining in. If you uh, just came in from the Whova platform, uh, sorry for the, the small delay there. Um, we are now live with our Guam uh, Ecosystems Collaboratorium for Corals and Oceans panel. And if you have any questions for the amazing scientists that we're going to be hearing from over the next few minutes, please feel free to put it in the chat and we'll ask our researchers to be responding there. Now for discussion of uh, reef resilience or the EPSCOR genomes part, uh, let's bring in Assistant Professor of Marine Invertebrate Genomics at the University of Guam Marine Laboratory, Dr. Sarah, uh, Sarah Lemmer and uh, Associate Professor of Population Genetics, Dr. David Kambash. Together, they serve as co-leads for the Guam EPSCOR Genomes Objective. We also will bring on researchers uh, to this uh, panel, Associate Professor of Biology, Dr. Dan Lindstrom, and Professor of Marine Biology and Phycology, Dr. Tom Shills. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, please introduce yourself, uh, speak of your background a little bit and your individual research goals. Um, what's its importance to ocean science um, and any broader research goals as well? So, uh, Dr. Lemmer, if you don't mind, please begin. Thank you, Austin. Half a day, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Lemmer. I'm an assistant professor of marine invertebrate genomics at the Marine Lab at UOG. Um, a little bit about my research uh, to give you an idea of how it fits into this broader project. Um, I uh, spent my whole career focusing on biodiversity, marine biodiversity of invertebrate species and how uh, it is, how the biodiversity arises, how it is maintained through time and how it is being affected by, you know, climate change or other human induced stresses. So I like, I usually study these uh, questions on biodiversity at different levels, at the species levels. 
uh, the first one, which is the broadest, uh, you know, question how species evolve through time uh, with their changing environment. We're talking large uh, bioevolutionary scales, but also at the population level. And this is more how populations are affected by um, fragmented habitat, whether that habitat is naturally fragmented or it is now fragmented because of human-induced activities. And finally, the last and the most precise um, um, uh, biodiversity level I work at is at the individual level, how individual species, uh, individuals within a species will adapt or react to their changing environment. So this is basically my background and I use genetic uh, tools to answer these questions. In this EBSCOR uh, project, the, the, um, the aim of the research I'm working on is basically looking at reef associated um, invertebrates and uh, how they are affected by changes in the reef that we see right now. So we all know that the reefs around Guam and in the region and in around the world are declining. And um, you will hear from my colleagues uh, who are studying specifically coral reefs and how they are declining, how they are affected by climate change. But I'm focusing on all these other taxa that are dependent on those coral reefs and how they are affected by the decline in coral reefs. So in Basically, in this project, we will be looking at um, different taxa, whether they um, rely on the reef as um, source food or habitats, or whether they depend on the reef, um, or meaning if they are harmful or beneficial to the reef. For example, what I mean by that is we'll be looking at species such as crown of thorn uh, sea stars, which are feeding on corals, and we have seen outbreaks that seem to be linked with, you know, either climate change or uh, ocean pollution. And we want to see how this dynamic changes and how it affects the reefs, especially when reefs are already declining. But on the other side, we're also looking at species that are beneficial to the coral, such as uh, the crab dwelling. Um, so some crabs live within the coral branches and actually protect the corals against um, crown of thorn sea stars. And so we're also wondering how these crab population and species will be or are affected by declining reefs and uh, climate change. So uh, what we're we doing, what we'll be doing exactly is, uh, first of all, before um, um, defining all these changes, we need to better characterize the population dynamics of these species in the region, in Guam, and in Micronesia in general. And there's very little known at this point at the genetic level on how these populations are connected across islands or even around Guam in different you know, parts of Guam, whether the reefs are slightly different on the East Coast or on the West Coast. And so this is the first thing we want to do is look at population connectivity of these uh, different species, the genetic diversity of these species um, in Guam and in the um, neighboring islands. And then we want to use an approach called seascape genomics, where we basically combine all this genetic information that we can get from these uh, populations and combine them with oceanography data, such as ocean current and um, temperature gradients or depth or salinity gradients and see if we can you know, correlate these two information to have a broader picture of those populations, the dynamics of those populations in the region. And that will hopefully help us uh, better predict how these populations will be affected by climate change. A very simple example I wanna give you is at this point we are we think that Guam being one of the biggest island of the Marianas is probably like the source um, island for um, seeding out, seeding out uh, um, larvae and of different, um, of different of these taxa around to the other islands. And so if the reefs on Guam are declining, we think probably some of these species will be affected. And if there's less of these populations on Guam, how will that affect the neighboring islands in the future? And so by combining, you know, oceanography models with uh, population genetics information, we hope to have a better idea of what will be the future of um, these populations in the region. Fascinating and uh, very important work, Dr. Lemmer. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that overview. Uh, Dr. Kambash, uh, could you share as uh, well? Sure. Uh, good morning and uh, half a day. Uh, my name is David Kambash. I'm uh, an associate professor of population genetics at the Marine Lab. Uh, I was originally born and raised in Germany and grew up very landlocked and, and sort of like got hooked on, on reefs 
uh, in the Caribbean. I did my PhD and a postdoc in Boston and came to Guam in 2016. And since then I have been working um, in uh, this uh, EBSCOR framework uh, and my research is really focused on population genetics. So this is uh, uh, the concern or uh, where, where we study the, the very first basic steps of evolution, uh, tiny genetic differences between different populations and between different species. That is really what, what population genetics is all about is, is understanding the first steps of evolution, how uh, organisms diverge and how they differ, how they are different. And that is really essential information when we think about how to manage and, and uh, protect different organisms to understand the subtle differences between them. So for example, one area that we're very interested in is uh, local adaptations. So that is how do different populations adapt to their local environment, how they're specialized for the, the, the environment that they grew up in, that they evolved in, so that they're the best possible, uh, they, they can take a full advantage of uh, their environment and can really thrive in there. And so it's really important to understand these subtle differences in order to uh, protect different populations that may have different adaptations. These adaptations usually come with trade-offs. For example, corals that are particularly resilient to elevated temperatures, to, to uh, hot summers, might grow a little slower under regular conditions. And so these trade-offs, it's really under, important to understand these trade-offs so we can try to manage and preserve as much of this diversity as possible. That ensures that um, organisms are able to adapt to changing environmental conditions in the near future. And that is really the main focus uh, of my research. Um, another important uh, example in that context that, that Sarah mentioned already is uh, gene flow and connectivity between populations. So to, to give you a, a little bit more practical example here, uh, my former grad student, Darian Rios, uh, studied uh, Acropora corals. That's a type of corals that uh, we have a lot of, for example, in Tumon Bay, these, these very branchy corals. Uh, so she studied uh, the genetics of these corals around Guam, and she found that Acropora populations near Agate Cemetery are connecting the more southern Cocos Lagoon populations to the populations here on uh, the, the west coast in East Agania Bay and um, in Tumon. So this population is really important to ensure the connectivity along the west coast. Um, genetic diversity in general is, is, I mentioned that already, is a main focus of our work. And uh, what my lab is particularly interested in or focused on are reef corals. So these are the corals that, that uh, build the reef, that really built this that three dimensional structure that all the other organisms live on. So for me, that's really important to understand the foundation, what really builds the reefs sort of like from the ground up. Uh, this is why I'm particularly interested in reef corals, in, in genetics and evolution, these very, very basic uh, sort of like foundations. Um, yeah. thank, thank you, Dr. Kambash. Very fascinating as, as well. And uh, uh, I really like hearing about the, the local adaptations because as isolated islands, we must have some really unique local adaptations uh, to be looking at through the next few years. And uh, I'm really interested to learn more about the genetic diversity of all the reef building corals as we go along in this project. Um, thank you again, Dr. Kambash. And now Dr. Dan Lindstrom. Uh, if you could please join us and, and give us an overview of um, your background and what you're working on with the Gecko Project. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dan Lindstrom. I am an Associate Professor of Biology in the Biology Department at the University of Guam. Um, the research I've been doing for the last 25 years or so has been focused on a group of animals uh, that are deemed diadromous, which basically means that they have to spend part of the obligatorily uh, spend part of their life in both freshwater and marine systems. Uh, Guam has a, a diverse group of these organisms uh, that live in our rivers in the south. 
uh, at certain times in their life history, and they include snails, um, native snails, native shrimp, and native bony fish. Um, I won't go into the, uh, the uh, information that Sarah and David gave you, but basically my questions will be the same, but focused on these organisms. <clears throat> and um, there's, there's basically three types of diadromy, and we have uh, organisms that, that do all three. Some of them live as adults in the rivers, and then when they spawn, uh, the larvae float out into the ocean and become part of the oceanic plankton and can travel great distances before they find their way back to a river and complete their life cycle. There's others that live that do the opposite thing, kind of like uh, eels and salmon. And so what we think is that uh, <clears throat> uh, the connectivity questions, we might even be able to uh, look at a finer resolution with these organisms because their targets are much smaller being the mouths of rivers. Um, we'll be collecting both here in Guam and uh, most of the major rivers in the south, uh, in Saipan and Rota and, and beyond. And we'll be using genetics as a tool uh, to measure that connectivity uh, to see whether these populations that are uh, quite distant from each other, or even close to each other, how connected they are and what that means for uh, all the questions that uh, David and Sarah uh, spoke of before. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Lindstrom. Uh, it's really exciting to hear how our new EPSCOR project is going to move, uh, not just from the, the marine environment, but we're going into uh, the freshwater aquatic environment to learn more about the organisms uh, there and our land, uh, sea, freshwater and marine science connections. So thank you, Dr. Lindstrom. Uh, Dr. Tom Shills, uh, same question uh, for you. Please give us uh, a little bit about your background and your work on the Gecko Project. Okay, good morning, Austin, and half a day, everybody. So <clears throat> I'm Tom Schultz, uh, and I'm a marine biologist with an interest in seaweed or macroalgae. So here in Guam, uh, we live and work in a tropical setting, and the reef systems around us are often referred to as coral reefs. The reality, however, is that these reefs are made up of a myriad of organisms, and macroalgae are, are one of the dominant organisms, often the dominant organisms on these reefs. So I started my career studying seaweed communities in South Africa for my master's thesis, uh, performed some ecophysiological work on invasive seaweeds in France, and focused my PhD and postdoc studies on the unique algal communities of the Northwestern Indian Ocean in Oman and Yemen. Um, since joining the University of Guam Marine Lab in 2006, I've been involved in a variety of ecological and diversity studies in the region. And for the Gecko project, we will try to unravel the diversity and the ecological roles of some sort of enigmatic group, uh, the Crustose red algae uh, here in Guam. Uh, members of this group um, of algae are often mistaken for corals by laymen, and they provide similar functions to our reefs as certain corals. Um, for example, some of these red algae build reefs, and particularly in reef zones where corals can grow like the reef grass, which is impacted by strong wave activity. So they kind of like form this thin living veneer uh, on reefs and protect the reefs. Other of these crustose red algae are required for coral recovery after severe disturbance events like coral bleaching, because coral larvae need these red algae to settle and find suitable habitats on these reefs. Uh, and other members of these crustose red algae outright compete directly with corals and other reef organisms for space on reef, uh, on, on reefs. Uh, so with uh, former Marine Lab student Matt Mills, who's also involved in the Gecko project currently, we discovered that the diversity in this group of crustose red algae that are ecologically so important is truly astonishing. Uh, before we started these studies, there were about 25 species reported for Guam. And the number of species that we've documented and collected so far exceeds 130 species, and very, very few correspond with the species that were initially reported for Guam. With another student, Mary Dinehart, which, which is now um, will be conducting a PhD in Australia soon, she has investigated in a controlled aquarium setting which of these crustose red algae are actually crucial for coral recruitment. And this surprisingly low number of species of red algae um, are surprisingly absent from our natural reef systems. 
So in Gecko, we aim to characterize the uniqueness of our tropical reefs here in Guam and the Mariana Islands, since many of the red algal species only occur here. Furthermore, we aim to investigate through DNA barcoding and population genetics how our reefs fit into the larger picture of reefs in the Western Pacific and by extension, the Indo-Pacific. So yeah, um, I can go into further detail on any of um, oh, That's great, uh, Dr. Schills. We really appreciate that, um, uh, that, that overview of your work. And I think that's really interesting for um, our audience to, to know that it's not just the, the stony reef building corals, there's also reef building algae, the crustos um, red algae that we need to be thinking about in our, um, our overall scientific goals to ensure more resilience um, after impacts like bleaching or, or storm events. So thank you very much for the work that you're doing, Dr. Schills, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Lemmer and, and Kambosh and Lindstrom as well for your work on um, the, uh, the genomes part of our uh, Guam Ecosystems Collaboratory for Corals and Oceans. Now, before we uh, get onto our, our next panel, uh, Dr. Fujimura, uh, Atsushi Fujimura was not able to join us today, but we did wanna share a little bit about his work. Uh, Dr. Fujimura is a assistant professor of oceanography, and um, he is involved in both the reef genomes and then the reef phenomes project that we're gonna be hearing about um, next. Um, since his research uh, is describing oceanographic conditions and the effect of environmental change on marine organisms, um, this is important to both of these areas. For the reef genomes, environmental variables such as water current and temperature are measured uh, in situ using multiple oceanographic sensors and GPS drifting buoys. The oceanographic data can then be used as input for ocean circulation models. And so the physical and individual based models will be combined to simulate the transport of larvae and propagules um, that will help us to understand the origins and the destinations of these organisms. So things like corals, and uh, maybe he'll be looking at, at fish and other organisms as well. For larval transport, water currents play an important role in the environment, but that also affects some settled adult organisms. For example, high water flow tends uh, to reduce the impacts of coral bleaching under stress conditions like high water temperature. For the reef genomes project uh, portion, Dr. Fujimura will investigate physiological processes in marine organisms under rapidly changing environments. Particularly, response of corals to stress will be tested underwater and temperature variables. And uh, now speaking of phenomes, let's move on to the phenomes portion of EPSCOR research. Um, so let's uh, hear from uh, our, our next panelist to talk about the resilience of key reef builders um, the EPSCOR Phenomes Research Project we have with us today, Interim Director and Professor of Marine Biology, uh, Dr. Lori Ramundo, Assistant Professor of Bioinformatics and Co-PI of the EPSCOR Research Portion, Dr. Bastian Bentledge, and Associate Professor of Mathematics, Dr. Leslie Aquino. Good morning, all. Good morning. Uh, now, I'm going to ask um, you to introduce yourselves, speak about your background and research goals and your connection to um, uh, your research in the Gecko project. Uh, Dr. Bentledge, please begin. Uh, buenas and half a day. Um, my name is Bastian Bentledge and uh, I'm an assistant professor of bioinformatics at the Marine Laboratory and uh, I'm also the co-PI of the uh, EPSCO project and, and um, uh, in terms of research, help implement uh, the phenomes portion of our research project. And before I talk about uh, the project, uh, my background, I'm also, from Germany, similar to Dr. Kambosch. And then I went to uh, the US to pursue my PhD and uh, basically stayed on to do uh, two postdoctoral fellowships, uh, one at the University of Maryland, where actually sort of like um, uh, 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 got additional training in bioinformatics um, and uh, the Smithsonian Institution, which was uh, essentially the last stop for me uh, before I came here in Guam and uh, started my current position. 
And prior to coming to Guam, I've actually not really worked on corals, but uh, on coral relatives. For most people, this might be quite surprising, but actually jellyfish are close relatives of corals. They used to be my study. Dr. Bentlich, could you turn up your audio just a little bit? We're having a little trouble hearing you. Thank you. I'm trying to, give me one second. Uh, that's about as far as it goes. So I might try to yell a bit. <laughs> I hope this is okay, better now. It's getting a little better. Thank you. Um, so the, as I said, before I came to Guam, I hadn't actually worked on, on corals, but on coral relatives, uh, jellyfish, and then uh, also close relatives of coral symbionts, uh, the zooxanthellae. Uh, <laughs> I always struggle with that term. Um, that are essentially the photosynthetic symbionts of corals. And uh, most people uh, here are probably familiar with uh, the idea that really the loss of the photosynthetic uh, symbionts of corals due to uh, rising sea surface temperatures is what causes coral bleaching and ultimately uh, the decline of corals and the reefs that they form. Um, and this is something that we have been observing for several years now uh, in Guam. Um, we didn't have a bleaching event uh, the last year, but uh, uh, several of the years prior. So in terms of the phenomes project, what we're really interested in is uh, looking at the phenotypic traits of corals and how those change or respond to environmental change. And uh, what is a phenotypic trait? Essentially, those are the observable and measurable uh, features of an organism. So something like the growth rate of the coral uh, would be... A, um, uh, a phenotypic trait, and that is something that um, uh, may change depending on the environment the coral grows in, right? If the environment changes, sea surface temperature rises, growth rate might slow down. Um, Dr. Donaldson early on mentioned sedimentation, so we have this issue with uh, coastal runoff in Guam, uh, especially in the bays in the south, so all those impacts, environmental impacts, might affect um, uh, the so like um, uh, uh, the, the health as we can measure it through phenotypic traits of um, our coral. Um, how do we study this? Uh, 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 these phenotypic traits, uh, we're using common gardens. That means uh, we're planting corals, uh, different species of corals, the important reef builders here in Guam, uh, together in plots and then track them over time uh, to see how their phenotypes uh, change in uh, relation to uh, seasonal differences of the environment, or we uh, look at corals that grow in different microenvironments, for instance, uh, different water flow regime uh, close to the reef margin or in the backwaters of our reef flats where the water is still and presumably hotter during the summer. Um, and this will have some impacts on, or like there's some direct kinds with coral restoration. I think Dr. Raimundo would be uh, uh, in the perfect position to talk about this. And then we also, and this is why we brought Dr. Aquino into the team um, uh, uh, and, and, and some of her collaborators here at the university um, as a mathematician, uh, we also want to use these traits ultimately to then model how, uh, model the reef dynamics, model how uh, the corals respond to climate change or other types of environmental impacts um, to then use these models, right? To make some uh, educated guesses of what will happen in the next 10, 20, 50 years as uh, climate changes um, uh, globally. And also as we see different local impacts on our reefs. And I think with that, my time is pretty much over. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to uh, uh, give the microphone to the next speaker. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Bentledge, uh, for starting us off for um, this portion of the, the panel. And now we'll go to uh, Dr. Lori Raimundo uh, for um, your work on the EPSCOR project and uh, your background as well, Dr. Raimundo. Good morning. Half a day, everyone. Uh, Lori Raimundo here. So I've been at University of Guam since 2004. I spent most of my life in the Philippines prior to that. So that is where I became a marine biologist and uh, where I saw both the effects of good management of reefs as well as what human beings can do to destroy them. So when I went into school, I really wanted to uh, focus my work on restoration. 
and learning how to grow corals, how to restore ecosystem function, how to restore reef function. And uh, that's sort of what I focused on, but then uh, I, I like to tell the story that I got into looking at human impacts on reef health by discovering a coral disease that had never been previously described. And so that's what got me more into looking at um, coral disease. And that is what much of my work has been since coming to Guam because we have a dearth of expertise in this area, in, in this ocean. And uh, as some of you may know, the Caribbean reefs right now are suffering a very terrifying disease that we really don't want to get over to our ocean. We don't want this disease here and we're realizing how, how crucial it is that we understand the impacts of diseases on marine organisms. Um, as, as Bastian just mentioned, um, Guam suffered a five-year period of coral death through a succession of, of warm water events coupled with extreme low tide events and disease outbreaks, all of these things being largely driven by anthropogenic um, global types of stressors. And um, so that got me back into restoration work. I was on a small team of incredibly uh, talented but exhausted people who went out and documented these events every year for five years. And we decided that we really needed to start turning our attention more to trying to develop restoration methods for some, at least some groups of species that were particularly hard hit, but at the same time have a very um, do well documented capacity for recovery. So what we're focusing on now is uh, the staghorn corals, which I'm actually collaborating with on another project with uh, Dr. Uh, Kambosh, David. So Bastian and I decided to pair up and recognize very early on that we needed Le Leslie's help with the modeling aspects. And we're really interested with this component of our project to looking at phenotypic responses to um, to the current climate change events that are impacting our reefs with the idea of trying to figure out uh, what, what phenotypic traits may provide some resilience value and what species may be at particular risk and, uh, and why. So we're interested in trying to figure out how our reefs are going to change in the near future in response to climate change and obviously we want to understand the physiological basis for this, but we also want to understand the environmental influences that could enhance resilience. And so we're trying to pull all of these kind of components together in this common garden experiment where we've selected uh, a couple of the more dominant species on our, on our shallow reefs in Guam. And we hope to try to figure out some of the things that are causing certain species to be able to do better and, and some, some of the characteristics that may be putting them more at risk. And, and then hopefully in the future, learning a little bit more about how we can facilitate survival better and, and facilitate the restoration of ecological functions. So things like uh, fish habitat and the role of, of fishes and the role of other invertebrates um, on, on creating and recreating these communities and uh, hopefully maintaining some semblance of coral reef structure and function in, in the coming years. Daunting and um, a little scary because we have no idea if any of this is going to work, but we need to try. <laughs> so I think. <laughs> yeah. They, well. Yeah. Thank you for trying, uh, Dr. Raimundo, and thanks for uh, bringing your diverse background on coral reefs to um, the Guam EPSCOR team from uh, reef restoration, uh, restoring reef function, and uh, your expertise in diseases. All of that um, is really important for, for our corals here in Guam and the region. So thank you. Um, and uh, now we will have uh, Dr. Leslie Aquino, um, new to our, our Guam EPSCOR team, to, to share the work she is doing. Hi, happy day, good morning. Um, hopefully this is loud enough for you, uh, Austin. 
Um, so yeah, I, <laughs> okay, great. So my background, um, I'm a math person. We, we don't get outside too often. So we're super <laughs> excited to be part of uh, this part of the research project. I'm working with Dr. Hunju Oh, as well as Dr. Jayang Choi. They're also two other math professors here at the university. And together we make up what we are calling our Gecko math team, our math modeling team. And we primarily support this particular research objective. And Dr. Choi is also supporting a little bit of an, uh, another aspect with uh, Dr. Bentledge. Um, so my background, you know, I'm you know, similar to Dr. Shelton, uh, raised here in Guam. Um, I'm a product of UOG. Uh, my, my PhD was primarily in the area of partial differential equations, which means uh, we like to model things. Um, we like to model natural phenomenon uh, that we see and try to figure out what's the math behind it. So my particular area from grad school involved sediment transport in you know, um, channels. So you know, where the sand and silt mix together. Um, but then I didn't do any of that for a number of years. I worked for the government and did uh, more cybersecurity stuff. But then we felt the calling to come back home. And so coming back here, it's been great to get back into math research and math modeling. And together with Dr. O oh and Dr. Choi, uh, we're very excited to be part of this. We've been doing some um, projects with undergraduates involving modeling of um, different populations affected by uh, diseases. And so, you know, some of that can translate to this work as well. But, you know, for us, we're, we're really kind of looking at, you know, what, what's been done in the past, what other types of mathematical models have been applied, and what can we use here? And then working together with Lori and Bastian, um, we'll take the data from their common gardens and try to then uh, use that data for the model specific to our region and hopefully try to come up with something that can help us predict what will happen, um, help us describe what's happening now as well as predict what's going to happen in the future. That's our, our current goal. So. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Aquino. I'm really glad that we have you on the team to help us with uh, the modeling and predicting so that we can achieve uh, that sustainable future for our island. Uh, and so it really sounds like in order to support these research goals, uh, heavy cyber infrastructure is needed. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Bentledge, yes, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bentledge, I understand that uh, your work ties in with the Guam uh, EPS for cyber infrastructure. So please stay with us for a discussion on that topic. And uh, Dr. Raimundo and Dr. Aquino really appreciate your time on this portion of the panel. Uh, now I'd like to uh, call up uh, Mr. Manny Hechenova uh, to support the research of Guam EPSCOR. We have the director of the University of Guam Office of Information Technology. Uh, that's Manny. He's here with us today to share about high throughput computing and the network operations center that supports um, EPSCOR research. Uh, Manny, uh, please uh, tell us uh, about this area of our, uh, of our project. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Shelton, for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be a part of the EPSCOR team. Uh, yes, we are the people that help them move their data, large, vast amounts of data, and do a lot of computing for them. So as part of the cyber infrastructure, uh, storage is a big consideration. So we do have you know, on-site storage for our, for our researchers up to 37 terabytes of uh, storage capacity for them, and we're growing that as well. So as their research data continues to expand, we're growing with them as well. We also have uh, high-speed data transfers. You know, now that we're collecting so much data, sharing it between the researchers and sharing it with other colleagues uh, off island becomes a challenge. And so we have high-speed data transfer nodes that are active within our center. We also have a, a large compute cluster that, uh, rather a local compute cluster that we use just to start processing this data. So from where we were several years ago and to where we are today, is, really night and day, we've really grown a lot and improved our cyber infrastructure. Our network connectivity, wow. Thanks to GORX, the Guam Open Research and Exchange, that's a project with NSF and University of Hawaii. Uh, we now enjoy a 10 gigabyte connection all the way to a new cable landing station on Guam. GNC and RTI has a, recently opened a new cable landing station last year. And we moved the GORX station, the GORX equipment from a previous carrier to that station, and that's done wonders for us because it's also offered us uh, more options and carrier services. 
So our 10, 10 gigabyte connection to them just supports the EPSCoR researching project and makes that large data transfer uh, very possible. We also participate in performance testing, high performance testing between the networks. And so between the research networks that we participate in, we have what's known as Curve Sonar and a MAD Dash component that we installed locally. So there's a grid when you go to the websites for Curve Sonar, there's a, uh, a two variable grid that shows the connectivity and the latency performance between all the institutions that are partnering with each other. So it's just great to be here. It's great to be at the university during this time. I've been with the university since 1996. Uh, my master's is in information systems and to see it evolve <laughs> really over these decades is truly amazing. And the F-score project is just going to take the university and our right. research level to the next level. So we're so we're really looking forward to that and are happy to be a part of it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Manny. Uh, and, and Dr. Bentledge, do you have anything to, to add a little bit more to our, our cyber infrastructure components of EPSCoR? Uh, yeah, I think one thing I could add to this, um, maybe I missed it, but but I'm not sure if uh, um, uh, Manny mentioned this. Uh, he mentioned data storage, right? But uh, one big thing we are also trying to do or planning on doing with, with EPSCoR is uh, to increase our um, uh, sort of like high performance computing uh, capabilities uh, to support essentially more uh, data intensive science. And uh, we have funding to essentially build a, a nice uh, a smaller to medium uh, compute cluster on uh, campus as well that uh, we hope will not only benefit our project but really become accessible to anyone who, who needs compute power um, uh, at UG. Well, thank you, Dr. Bentledge and, and Manny. It's really great to have um, this growing cyber infrastructure on our campus to, uh, to help uh, stimulate more competitive research in our jurisdiction and uh, lead to more cutting edge science here in Guam and throughout Micronesia. Uh, now I'd like to uh, go on to the next part of our, um, our EPSCoR program uh, for this morning. Um, so I, I'm really uh, so honored to be working with these amazing colleagues from uh, the University of Guam Marine Laboratory and the College of Natural and Applied Sciences uh, uh, in the math department, in the natural sciences department, and also with Manny over at the Office of uh, Information Technology. And so my role at the, um, the Guam EPSCoR Gecko project is to serve as the coordinator of the education and workforce development components of uh, the EPSCoR grant. And so we're, we're doing quite a bit of work um, in other areas around campus uh, with faculty from, um, from, from different areas. So we heard on day one uh, during the Guam Green Growth meeting about the Guam Green Growth Commitment. Uh, and so that is a partnership with the University of Guam School of Business and Public Administration, uh, the Masters of Public Administration students. Uh, so Dr. John Rivera over there is a collaborator on EPSCoR. Um, and then later today, you'll hear about the G3 circular economy work um, with our coordinator, Miracle Mughal. And um, another really special part of the, the Guam EPSCoR program is uh, this, the commitment to broaden the participation of Pacific Islander and underrepresented minority communities in STEM fields, so that's science, technology, engineering, and math, through the, the uh, development of a research program that helps ensure the sustainability of coral reef ecosystems in the face of environmental change. Uh, so the lead um, person working with our student participation group is Dr. Cheryl Sangeza from the School of Education. Um, and you heard from her uh, yesterday, if you were tuning in, uh, she's also working on our National Science Foundation Includes program, which is a very nice compliment to all the student capacity building work that we're doing. So uh, this morning, I wanted to introduce you to one other new person. And so here to join us to speak briefly on Guam EPSCoR student programs, is uh, our EPSCoR Education and Workforce Development Program Associate, Sho Hammond. Uh, good morning, Sho. Good morning, Dr. Shelton, and uh, half a day, everyone. Thank you for having me today. I'm excited to be part of a great team that supports many talented and aspiring biologists. Um, well, you know, thanks for joining us, Sho. Can you uh, uh, explain about the Guam EPSCoR student programs and how how many students are we actually able to uh, support throughout the course of this five-year project? 
Sure. Uh, Guam X score currently supports uh, both undergraduate and graduate students with uh, research assistantships. The assistantships provide financial assistance and pair a student with an advisor from the EPSCOR research team. Students gain rich research experiences in the areas discussed earlier and uh, getting paid to work on diverse coral reefs on Guam is a pretty nice deal. For the undergraduate students, we have our Student Research Experience, or SRE. It's a year-long assistantship for UOG undergraduates. Students can receive a monthly stipend of $500 and work with an advisor to develop a project that contributes to EBSCOR research. In 2021, Gecko launched its first Coral and Oceans SRE cohort, uh, supporting six undergraduate students. We are happy to have a diverse group of undergraduates participating and hope they value the experience as well. We are also currently developing an SRE program uh, for the math research team. So we will have six positions available for the summer. Uh, some information will be posted to our website. For the graduate students, uh, we have the graduate research assistantship. It's a three year long program uh, designed to train graduate students in scientific research. Students benefit from a tuition waiver to pursue a master's degree. They also benefit from research training, faculty mentorship, and a $18,000 annual stipend, which is about $1,500 per month. Um, over the past school year, we have been able to support about 15 graduate students, uh, four successfully defended theses and graduated last semester. Three are expected to defend their thesis and graduate this spring. And we have also selected eight new GRAs to join the program this year. Uh, we also expect to include another 15 graduate positions over the next two years. And we're ex excited to support them and provide engaging research experiences they can take with them after graduate school. Thank you very much, Sho. We have uh, lots of amazing uh, student opportunities um, out there for our uh, Pacific Island community. So we, we really encourage um, any students that might be listening or uh, faculty members out there from different institutions, uh, please check out our Guam EPSCOR uh, website. Um, you can search it at the University of Guam uh, website, find the Guam EPSCOR program, uh, connect with us, We'd love to be sharing more of our, our research and student opportunities. And uh, Dr. Donaldson in the very beginning mentioned about the Gecko um, Collaboratorium. So that means we're, now that we have this added research capacity, the amazing teams on phenomes and genomes and uh, the growing cyber infrastructure, there's a lot more work that we can be doing uh, together with partners around the world, um, all funded by this National Science Foundation uh, program, which is the established program to stimulate competitive research. And so that's what we're ramping up here in Guam, uh, a perfect time for the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, because the United Nations tell us that just in uh, these next few years, it's a really critical time, a critical window uh, where we need to do everything that we can uh, to save the oceans. And so, uh, you know, we've, we've made really great time on um, this panel. So I want to um, offer uh, time for maybe one or two responses from our panelists still in the Zoom room with us. Um, if, if any of you would like to, to chime in on how you think that EPSCOR program, uh, the GECCO program, is uniquely positioned to help achieve the goals of the ocean decade, which is essentially um, to have a sustainable future for our oceans. Awesome. Dr. Donaldson, yes, thank you. Um, I think one of the key things to remember is Guam has probably the most diverse coral reef system in the entire United States. And uh, although we've been studying it for over 50 years and, and indigenous people have been studying it even longer, um, there's still a lot to learn. And I think in order to be able to meet the goals uh, that you've um, described, it's important to understand what's going on with what lives in the ocean, the ocean itself, and then you know what, what its limits are, you know what its uh, abilities are in terms of, of adjusting to change. Um, I, 
getting a key understanding of these various uh, processes that are going on, I think it is, is extremely important towards being able then to manage difficulties that arise within, within the ocean, manage difficulties that arise with uh, fisheries stocks, let's say, or the, the quality of our reefs that protect our islands and provide all kinds of sustenance, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in general, it's better to do things when you're informed as opposed to not being informed. And uh, EBSCOR has allowed us to really ramp up our game towards gaining that understanding. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Donaldson. That's a great point uh, to end this uh, panel on. Uh, we thank you all again for tuning in to uh, the first session of the day uh, with our Guam Ecosystems Collaboratory for Corals and Oceans. Please stick around. Uh, we have exciting new things coming up in the, the next few hours. So just Maasi. Just Maasi, Dr. Shelton and panelists. Thank you for all your contributions in helping advance United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Number four, quality education. And 14, life below water. Your mentorship and research.